I'm Benjamin Haddad. I'm the director of the Future Europe Initiative. And thanks for joining us today for this panel, a virtual panel, the first in the history of the Atlantic Council, uh, given the circumstances. It's very apropos that we're doing it on uh, the EU and the impact of uh, the coronavirus. I'm really glad to be uh, joined by three great analysts uh, from Washington, D.C., from Paris, from Rome. Uh, today, Rachel Donadio, who is a contributing writer at the Atlantic magazine, writes on all things Europe and is based uh, in Paris. And of course, uh, you may have read uh, some of Rachel's analysis on how uh, European societies are coping with the spread of COVID-19 um, these last few days. Uh, Natalie Tocci joining us from Ro Rome, the director of the Institute of International Affairs and Giovanna De Maio, a visiting fellow at the Center on the United States in Europe at the Brookings Institutions. Um, let me just say a, a word on the logistics of this conversation because we do want this to be interactive. We wanna hear from you. We wanna be able to answer uh, your questions. We're here for an hour, but we want this to be conversational. Um, there's a few ways to interact and engage with us today. Um, we're uh, here live through Zoom. Uh, if you connect through Zoom, you can just um, uh, send your question or comments on uh, through the chat function, and we'll, we here can see them at the Atlantic Council, and, and we'll, I will ask them to uh, our panelists. Uh, you can also engage with us on Twitter. Uh, this conversation is live streamed on two accounts, on the Future Europe Initiative account, ACE, at AC Future Europe, and on my personal account, at Benjamin Haddad, and you can just send questions to either of these two accounts and, and we'll um, select them to ask them to our, our panelists. And finally, on Facebook, uh, where the conversation is also live stream, you can ask questions in the comments on uh, the page of the Atlantic uh, Council. So we have a team here that will, that will read the, the, the questions and, and we'll, we'll ask them. Um, this is obviously, as Giovanna has said in the piece this week, a major stress case for Europe in the European Union. For the United States, uh, we've seen uh, the, the spread of COVID-19 be a, a planetary, a global uh, challenge to uh, uh, our democracies. Um, I don't want today to go too much into uh, the health issues um, or, or the, the scientific uh, background, but mostly talk about what this means for uh, the institutions of the European Union, what this me it means for the liberal democracies of Europe, how they are coping with it. We've seen, obviously, elite quarantine uh, itself um, and see, you know, is this one more challenge for the European Union? Is it one more challenge for uh, democracies after the, the crisis that we've seen in the last few years? Uh, what, uh, what is in, 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 um, uh, in it in the, in, the, in the next few weeks? Uh, and so this is the question I'd like to ask my, uh, my panelists today. Let me start with you, Rachel. You're, you're based in Paris. You uh, have talked in your last article about European uh, societies being in denial about the compromises that had to be made uh, to cope with this crisis. Can you tell us a little bit more about your views on this? Sure. Well, as you said, I am based in Paris, but I've been following Italy very closely from the safe distance of Twitter. In fact, people have written me to say, I hope you're okay. And I say, I hope so too. But if I catch the virus from Twitter, you'll you'll be the first to know. I, I think that it we've all been extremely worried and distraught watching things unfold in Italy in the last few weeks. We've gone from February 27th when the head of the um, Democratic Party in Italy went to Milan Milan in solidarity to say Milan doesn't stop and had an aperitivo to last Saturday when he himself came down with, announced he had come down with the virus, to, of course, the measures introduced on Sunday that put Lombardy in lockdown and then spread to the whole country on Monday. It's been extremely distressing and, and confusing. I'm curious to hear what Natalie there in Italy has to say about this later, but it really is the the biggest test for a western democracy since the i think the second world war to put this many people under some form of lockdown and i'm struck i've been following so closely in italy that i left the house in paris the other day i went to the store and thought oh my gosh i should really stock up you know the attitude in paris is like ça arrive you know these things happen it's and and the french are are i think there's a kind of disdain italy's overreacting but if you've looked at the charts that we've all looked at, this is rising exponentially everywhere. And it's been interesting to me to watch how different countries respond. So the French 
government of Emmanuel Macron has been, you know, very measured. We're taking things day by day. If we need to increase the level, we will, but life goes on pretty much as normal, even though all the signs we've gotten from Italy and from elsewhere show that this is a disease with no cure. The only thing you can do is prevention. The best form of prevention is social distancing. So I think it's kind of only a matter of time. It's also been interesting to me. I've been trying as a journalist to find out some numbers on the numbers of tests being done in different countries. France won't tell you how many tests have been done. So Italy has done a lot of tests and Italy will tell you pretty much anything. I mean, every day they announce these. So I think I, I, as a, I have a question, not an answer about maybe the, the high rates in Italy are also because, you know, they're doing more tests and, and talking about it more openly. Germany, as we've seen, has also been a little bit, um, a little bit in denial, but also today Angela Merkel said, of of course, that you know, 60 to 70 percent of people might get some form of this. Of course, Germany is a much more federalized system where the different lender have a certain amount of, of power. So you have a football match played with a full match and, and a full, with a full you know stadium in one place and and not in another. I I think that you know it's been interesting to watch the political tensions and other European countries kind of wondering what's going on in Italy, we have, they have this, you know, undeserved, well, or maybe deserved, I don't know, reputation for like overreacting. But the fact is, if the healthcare systems of Lombardy, the richest and most advanced region in the country are reaching a really extreme point of, of strain where there aren't going to be enough ICU beds, that has nothing to do with, you know, I mean, that that's a fact. And it's a fact that has to do with exponential growth. So I, I wonder if the, if the delay you know, in, in different European countries reacting is, is a political one, not based on, on you know, medical uh, evidence and the numbers. A, uh, a political delay, and, and you're right, uh, as you said, the, the, probably the biggest test for Western democracies since uh, World War II. Uh, and, and I think it is useful to underline, as you did, that uh, the, the, the peak of the crisis in Italy and Lombardy is in the richest region in, in Italy, uh, in places like uh, Milan, where you you have a, a very robust uh, healthcare system, and yet hospitals are, are overwhelmed. This is something that may be a little lost in the conversation here in in the United States. Let me turn actually to uh, Natalie Tocci. Natalie, you're in Rome. We hope that you're safe and that uh, your uh, your loved ones are, are safe as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you view this this crisis from Rome? What the mood is here and and, and what you think you know, are uh, people's expectation and reaction to how the government is handling this? Well, I mean, I think many of the things that Rachel was saying are absolutely right. I mean, you know, I think we're basically, uh, and I think this is true for Italy as it's true for any other country, I could tell you what the mood is today and what it was you know, in the last days and weeks and, uh, and months. It's very difficult to tell you how the mood is going to change. And the point here is that it changes day by day. Uh, and it changes day by day precisely because we're faced with a phenomenon uh, that is completely uncertain and whose development uh, we have no real uh, clear idea of. So uh, basically, I think, you know, there was a first phase in Italy in which there was a sort of debate, let's say, you know, sort of broadly speaking, between uh, sort of alarmists and optimists. Huh? Uh, and I must say that I personally definitely fell <laughs> into, uh, into the latter uh, category. Um, and, and, and indeed, we didn't really know what was going on. We knew, obviously, what China was doing. And we kind of thought that um, this is not, as you were saying, Ben, uh, the kind of thing that a liberal democracy would do or would be able uh, to do. Um, and so it was sort of, you know, tentative and trial and error for, for, for quite some time. Until, of course, the point that Rachel was, was, was making is absolutely correct. I mean, the, the minute, uh, the, the, you know, Things started changing here, um, the minute in which uh, in the northern regions, and this is something, you know, I'm sitting here in Rome, in lockdown in Rome, there isn't a major problem in Rome, but the minute in which uh, regions of the north, uh, essentially their, their public health system, which is indeed the best in the country, uh, started seriously suffering. I mean, you know, we have regions in the north where basically there are no more respirators available. Uh, and only those that are under 60, now, frankly speaking, 60 is not very old at all, uh, but only those under 60 are given priority for respirators, which means everyone above 60 uh, could well die <laughs> because, uh, because of respiratory uh, problems connected with COVID-19. 
So this essentially is, is what changed the tone of the debate and basically led people, people like me that definitely fell in the optimist camp to say, hang on a sec, we don't actually know what's going on here. Now, <clears throat> the problem is, and this connects, Benjamin, to some of the points that you were making, that we didn't have any real models to follow, or rather the only model uh, that there was to follow uh, is indeed the Chinese model, which does seem uh, to, to be uh, sort of paying off. Uh, now, this is ultimately what was done in Italy. So initially, the red zone was uh, restricted, obviously, to, to northern Italy, and the lockdown was restricted to northern Italy. And now, uh, as of a couple of days, it's been expanded to the rest of the country. It could get even worse, meaning that we are now allowed uh, to travel, to, to move. So we're not allowed to travel. We are allowed to move within our uh, cities, for instance, uh, for exclusively for reasons connected with uh, work and health. Um, we're not allowed to go anywhere, uh, anywhere else or for any other reason. Um, but it could get even more serious. I mean, we, we could be in a situation in which uh, work is stopped altogether. So we, we don't quite know. This is literally something that is moving, moving day by day. Now, the point, though, that I was making here is that it is very much a, a trial and error uh, with reference to one particular model. Now, it has to be said, and this is, if you like, on a note of reassurance, that indeed we did adopt the Chinese model, but in an Italian way, so in the way of a liberal democracy. So no, we don't have uh, police forces uh, uh, or, or, or military forces uh, deployed onto the street, arresting anyone that pokes his or her nose out of the house. Uh, but the streets are empty. Uh, and I think this is actually quite an interesting point, because I think what is emerging, now be it out of fear or be it out of solidarity, uh, people actually are respecting, uh, broadly speaking, I mean, just as I said, um, um, uh, evidence from uh, simply uh, uh, looking out on, uh, to what's going out here, they are actually respecting uh, what the government uh, is saying. Um, and, and this is mainly not so much because of the personal fear of being infected, but because of the fear of infecting others, in particular infecting uh, the elderly. So I think this is actually quite, I mean, you know, there, there is a silver lining uh, in this, and I think it's important to, to highlight this. Now, of course, whether this actually does reveal to be a silver lining or not depends on whether we can't say it uh, today or tomorrow, but whether in a week's time we'll be able to say that the me measures that were taken so far are actually uh, effective or not. But going back to the sort of broader European implications of all this, um, I think it is, you know, as a, you know, sort of Italy was unfortunate to be uh, the first when it came to, to Europe. But it's very clear, and, and Rachel was rightly making this point, if you actually map uh, the, the evolution uh, of the curve, uh, and you simply transpose what was happening in Italy a couple of weeks ago to what is currently happening in Germany or in France, basically the trend is identical. So absolutely nothing makes us believe that this will not be repeated, which is why it's so important uh, for other countries to basically look at Italy's experience and try and see, you know, try and sort of avoid the trial and error of it uh, and actually try and learn lessons for it. Now, in order to do this, obviously, the European uh, dimension is absolutely key. Now, let's face it, Europe did kind of wake up slightly late uh, in, in this process. It kind of woke up yesterday uh, over all this. Um, now, the, so there's an element of coordination and information sharing uh, and lesson learning, and also attempting to preserve, obviously, the integrity of the single market, avoiding that countries uh, go entirely their own uh, random way, as uh, Austria or Slovakia or Portugal uh, seem to be doing. So there's obviously a EU role, if you like, in, in ensuring uh, coordination. But then there is obviously the funding side of it, and this is absolutely key not only because it is an opportunity for Europe to actually demonstrate the solidarity that are in the treaties. So the 25 billion that were uh, pledged yesterday uh, to actually see concretely what that money uh, uh, can be, can and is being uh, and will be uh, used for. But also because obviously all this does not happen in a vacuum. And this is really the last point that I wanted to make. Uh, today uh, in Italy, one of the you know, sort of big news was the fact that uh, China will be sending to Italy 2 million masks and 100,000 respirators. 
Now, if the narrative that emerges, and this goes back and here I'll end, Benjamin, to, to your point, if the narrative that emerges is not only that a quote unquote authoritarian way of handling the virus is effective, but that an authoritarian country is actually the one that comes to the rescue uh, because uh, the EU is slow as, and, and ineffective and because the United States doesn't really seem to be even acknowledging the problem whatsoever. And here comes China that sends over 100,000 respirators uh, to a country where the, everyone over 60 in the north of the country uh, is uh, risks dying because of a lack of them. Well, then the long term consequences, not simply the short to medium term ones, are politically, I mean, you know, we haven't even touched on the economic side of it, but I would be politically devastating. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. This, yeah. this is really fascinating. I mean, I, I like your approach of describing this as the Chinese model, but in an Italian way, compatible with liberal democracy. But at the same time, it is indeed a major stress test of European solidarity, of European unity, of coming to the support of, of Italy that is, as you said, more and, and as Rachel underlined as well, a harbinger of things to come, more than an outlier, of course. And, and I want to turn to, to Giovanna uh, at Brookings, about this, Giovanna, you precisely wrote a very interesting analysis uh, this week uh, about this, about how this is a stress test for the European Union. You had a fairly, I, I would say, optimistic approach about Europeans' ability to actually uh, cope with this together and come to the support of Italy and also of, uh, sort of containing a nationalist and populist upsurge in, in this. Uh, how do you feel about how things are evolving in the next few days and how the European Union can, can show an alternative way of, of dealing with this than authoritarian models as uh, Natalie uh, warned against. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I would like to queue up with uh, the silver lining that Natalie was uh, highlighting, but mostly related to the fact that this crisis has shown, has exposed really the limits of populism. Because we have, um, as uh, the audience might recall, um, the Italian government is a government coalition between Five Star Movement and the Democratic Party, that is the center left. Five Star Movement initially was falling into the category of left wing populism. Initially the coalition was with league around the right-wing populism and so in this stage facts and movement has shown has set aside all this uh, old uh, Eurosceptic narrative in order to embrace a much more cooperative approach and looking at international cooperation and of, of course to the EU and Prime Minister Conte has shared uh, very positive uh, remarks about how the EU has, came, has come to help um, this happen like today. Um, at the same time the leader of uh, the League Salvini besides some initial criticism and blaming migrants coming from Africa, the Chinese communities in Tuscany for having brought the disease, um, yes uh, uh, this nar populist narrative, nationalist narrative aside, uh, came, of course, um, to the real facts to be completely useless. And therefore, um, I feel that um, th there has been a little bit of a switch and uh, also the oppositions um, made by the, the Salvini's League and in the center right, other parties in the center right are, are showing a much more cooperative approach with the government, especially vis a vis uh, the deficit spending that has been, uh, that will be uh, finally voted on Friday, and all the resources that have been allocated you know, just to support the healthcare system. Um, I want to echo Natalie's uh, point on the stress that has been put on the Italian healthcare system that has been um, seen a lot of uh, significant cuts since 2008, but still remaining between the best in the world. But I still have to say from reports of, um, and I'm proud to have a couple of friends, doctors working in the red zones that are really reporting from the field that it, what is happening is just a disaster in one of the most efficient regions of Italy, especially as far or as, far the, um, um, as concerning the lack of respirator that force for doctors to very heartbreaking choices of choosing whom to save and of course of course, uh, this is also having incredible economic consequences, as this must be probably the source of denial for many other countries, because now th the damage is really uncountable. We really can tell right now. We will be facing this once the virus is gone. Um, the damage for now assesses around like 60% less tourism, of course, in Milan, in Venice and other cities. Um, all the damages for small and medium enterprises uh, that are the core of Italian economy. And they are, of course, facing 
um, uh, contraction in consumption and of course in the number of people that can actually go to work. Um, a lot of social unrest and I'm not really positive about the talent response as I've seen a few, a few days ago as soon as the government announced um, that there were was uh, the announced there was a leak to the regions that was announcing the closing up of the Lombardy region people started fleeing from the north to the south and of course this contributed also to spread the disease in the south but coming to the most important point of, of a stress test for Europe um, yes I was I think I was very I was kind of positive and especially after yesterday's um, communique um, I think there was much more um, optimism on how the EU is responding in terms of scientific coordination putting experts together sharing information but I have to say uh, the narrative that Natalie was highlighting about Chinese sending uh, China sending masks to Italy uh, it's really striking because there is a fact and I actually was researching on Salvini his page and I saw this uh, this statement blaming the EU for not sharing masks and not not uh, sending them and I thought it was fake news and I went checking on uh, actual um, news papers and yes it was true that it be at the beginning of on March 6 at the European Council with, that reunited the Minister of Health, France, Germany and Czech Republic um, had put a ban, were, were pretty unconvincible to lift the ban on uh, medical, protective medical gear. It doesn't seem to be the case right now. It seems that the European Commission has embraced um, um, like a, a collective approach to this, so basically buying and collecting all the masks and then redistributing uh, to, the, to European countries. But, that's, um, but things are evolving as we speak. Uh, thank you very much, Giovanna. It's interesting, as you were uh, talking about this, we're seeing some reactions and questions on, on Twitter, uh, people talking about uh, propaganda or Chinese narrative when it comes to the masks. And we have some questions, and, and I'd love for any of you to address them on how quickly uh, will the European Union uh, aid come and, and how quickly will it translate into effective purchase of, of material. Uh, so we, we've heard of a 25 billion commitment from the European Union in economic help, including 7.5 billion that would be uh, distributed quickly uh, according to the um, uh, EU uh, message. But, but obviously there's a question of, of, you know, beyond the messaging and the narrative, how, how quickly that, uh, uh, that could come. I don't know if you want to say, add something to, to this, um, Giovanna, or if we, uh, if we just continue the, the conversation? Um, yeah, I think it's just fresh news about, uh, but I don't really know how this is going to be implemented for sure. There has been a lot of, like uh, Ursula von der Leyen was at the forefront of this. Uh, there is a task force for the virus uh, for, that may, it's made of like uh, commissioners that will be uh, really active on this. Uh, but I, uh, I'm not so positive about how quickly the EU will react to it. But for sure, this is a positive sign. Maybe Natalie has something to add on this. Yeah, let me uh, let me turn to to, to Rachel uh, um, in Paris, and you've been obviously following the, the very closely, analyzing the news coming out of the European Union to react to uh, what Natalie and Giovanna have been have been saying. But also, I mean, it, it was striking to me that you sort of mentioned the mood in Paris as being a little nonchalant uh, about this, and I think here in the United States as well, there's been. Um, a debate within the, the administration about whether to try to calm down people and markets, but at the same time uh, showing that the administration is on, is on top of things. And this sort of gives an impression of, of confusion, if not of, of denial of the, um, uh, the, the challenge at hand. Uh, Rachel, can you tell us a little more about what's going on in France and Paris? And, and we've heard uh, Chancellor Merkel obviously uh, speak this morning. You, uh, you quoted her as saying that something like close to two thirds of the German population could be contaminated. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about how these two countries are looking at Italy and, and, and dealing with this. I think that, um, you know, in France, no one's mentioned, I mean, I don't think they've mentioned Italy. They're following it obviously very closely. I don't think anyone is going to come out and say, oh my God, we don't want this to happen to us. But I think there's just a different kind of approach. In France, you know, Macron went to the theater last Friday to show solidarity, you know, the cultural field. There's a huge, huge economic 
issue at stake, obviously, here. But there's also a question of the healthcare system. And here in France, there's also a democratic issue. There are municipal elections coming up this Sunday and the following Sunday. If I were to be kind of jokey cynical, I'd say the quarantine starts in France the day after the municipal elections. Because if you suspend elections in France, the people will, you know, then you're subverting democracy. And already that's a big criticism of Macron before this happened is that he's kind of a, you know, Jupiter and, and, and very imperious in that, in that way. So these are elections and they want people to go out and vote in them. As I said earlier, we don't know how many tests have been done in France. I mean, you could also say, we certainly know that they've been done in Macron's cabinet because the culture minister of France has announced that he has tested positive for the virus and the Elysee won't say when his last contact was with President Macron, but he cl they claim it was you know, a week or so ago. I don't know. I mean, they say that all the protocols are being taken. People are working from home if they, if they have to, but obviously this is something that's reached you know, very high up in, in the cabinet. And again, I think we have here a cultural attitude and just, a, you know, French society is a little bit more, I wouldn't say less emotional than Italian society, but, you know, it's very kind of, let's figure out the numbers, how many people will might die versus the impact on the economy. Whereas, you know, in Italy, it's like grandma is in trouble, shut down the borders a little bit. This is a huge overstatement, but it shows something about the emotional volatility of Italy. I have not seen that kind of emotional volatility in, in France. Yeah. And then you had you, um, uh, another um, question on, on the testing from what you hear. So it's very interesting that you're saying the French government is not communicating on the number of people who are getting tested. We are seeing different... It's communicating on the number of cases and on the number, but we don't know the number of tests. And, and do you know what the policy is regarding tests? How, uh, who is getting tested? Is it voluntary or are, they, uh, are there specific communities where they're testing people more? I mean, there are some communities that have been shut down into a kind of quarantine in the, in the Val d'Oise outside Paris and also in the, in the Alps um, and also in, in Corsica where schools have been closed for two weeks because there was an outbreak. So there are different clusters that are being contained. I think there's a lot of confusion about who get tests anywhere in the world, frankly. And so there, there, today in the French press, there were reports of doctors and nurses being confused about who should get a test and, mm -hmm. and when. And I think they're still trying to figure out the protocols for that, as they are everywhere. I mean, the United States is, is not, it's kind of hard to figure out the, you know, the, the testing there. So this is, I mean, we're all of us in the last five days have tried to become kind of experts in, you know, epidemiology, but it's, mm -hmm. um, but again, I also think that the way that different governments communicate information is obviously very telling of those individual governments. And so, you know, France, it's very centralized. Here are the numbers. And then in Italy, it's like, you know, before Prime Minister Conte gave a press conference saying all Italy was shutting down, the Luigi Di Maio, one of the members of the government, already announced it to the press on the side. So, you know, I mean anarchic release of information that somehow winds up possibly being more transparent than centralized, very controlled release of information. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting point you're making. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is going to speak from the Elysee in a, in a formal address to the French nation today, I think tonight. Tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, in, in Paris, whereas we saw uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, standing next to Jens Spahn, the health minister, and in a press conference at the hospital in a format that was much more informal and interactive when talking about this uh, uh, this morning. And it does say a lot about different appreciation of verticality of power and different uh, uh, um, ways of, of communicating uh, that are typical of the French and, and, and German systems. Um, let me just say a, a, a quick word reminding people to use the, the chat on Zoom to ask questions to our different uh, panelists, as well as the Twitter account. You can ask questions to either the AC Future Europe Twitter account or my own Twitter account, both for live streaming this, uh, this conversation. We're getting a very good engagement on, on Twitter or on the Atlantic Council Facebook page in the comment section where this conversation is also being uh, live streamed. Let me turn again to uh, Natalie Tocci in, in Rome. Natalie, I, I um, I was looking at your Twitter account and, and I noticed that uh, you were actually in, in Tokyo uh, uh, until fairly recently uh, where you did uh, participate to conversations about how 
uh, Asian countries are dealing with uh, the coronavirus and the impact that it has on Asian security. Obviously, it was a few days ago, so I, I assume a lot of things have already changed since then. But um, I'd love to hear about uh, your experience, what you described earlier about sort of the, the way China has dealt with this and is providing a, a tricky model for Western uh, democracies. But we've also seen uh, some more, uh, some successful uh, um, uh, so far um, uh, ways of, of dealing with this coming from Taiwan or coming from, from South Korea, uh, which could provide other kinds of models. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about this. Yeah, actually, I was going to I was going to raise this. I mean, indeed, I was I was traveling in Japan, but this really gives you I mean, goes going back to a point that I was making earlier, I mean, about how quickly moods are changing, you know. Um, so yes, indeed, you know, last week, I was in Japan, and it didn't kind of strike me as sort of doing anything particularly strange. I mean, you know, yes, there are others that maybe wouldn't have gone at this point in time, but I really thought it was it was still okay. Um, only a week passed and obviously we're living in a completely different universe. So just to sort of highlight the point that um, moods uh, indeed are determined by national culture and a set of different things, but they do change very quickly according to two events. And it only took one day in which all of a sudden 1,500 cases went up where indeed panic spread. Uh, and this was essentially the turning point, which, as I said, if you look at the curves for any other country, it can happen. In fact, it will happen <laughs> in other countries uh, in, in a couple of weeks from now. But, but going back to the comparison with, with other Asian countries, I mean, I think in, in some respects, if we look at the cases of Japan and South Korea, uh, let's say Japan, where I was physically in, um, I'd say in some respects, obviously very similar. So yes, uh, schools are shut. Um, but then again, it's, you know, schools are shut, but they kind of would have been shut anyway now because they're on their spring break. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's less of a sort of disruptive uh, measure. Um, meetings are, they were still allowed. Um, whereas in Italy, basically, it was during my stay there that the decision was taken, was taken not to allow public meetings. Um, so I would say that on the, on the, on the sort of uh, front of closure, uh, you know, like closure slash openness, um, definitely I would say that we are more or less on, on uh, you know, following a similar path. Again, it, it is really a question of, of trial and error. Um, I would say that in Japan compared to Italy, I mean, again, this is, this is part of, of national culture. Obviously, you saw many more masks. Uh, but then again, in Asian countries, you see masks, uh, regardless of uh, a coronavirus. Um, so, you know, it, it is one of these things that takes time to latch on to a country like Italy or any other European country or indeed uh, the United States. Um, but what indeed struck me, I mean, you raise you raise Taiwan and I think this really is, I mean, it's true, it's a very, very small place, but it, you know, compared to uh, some of the other cases that we're looking at, um, but, but I think it's, it is incredibly interesting because of the way in which, yes, indeed, they have adopted closure, but they've done it in a selective way, essentially by using uh, big data uh, to pinpoint uh, which were the high risk categories uh, with whom a preventive and very strict quarantine uh, had to be implemented. Uh, Italy did not go this way because it has been, as I said, you know, first, uh, you know, first European country facing this trial and error sort of, you know, debate as as one does have basically in in uh, uh, in liberal democracies as to what is right and what is wrong, to what extent, uh, you know, should we uh, try and calm down and indeed think about the the political and the economic and the social implications. Uh, of, uh, of a very drastic closure and to what extent should we adopt a sort of public health lens and essentially listen to what uh, virologists and epidemiologists are, are, are telling us, uh, where indeed also within the scientific community there is a degree of a debate, obviously, uh, too. So obviously it's a far messier situation, but I would say that in general it's not a drastically, I mean, you know, sort of if you bar the national culture elements of this, uh, which have to do with approaches to public hygiene, for instance, uh, uh, and the, you know, the use of, I mean, the use of masks is the most obvious uh, case in point. But I think in terms of closure measures, 
Uh, I would say that it, not that dissimilar uh, in terms of organization mm, and level of public debate, definitely far messier in Italy, as it will be messier in France and Germany and, 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 and the United States uh, compared to some of these Asian cases. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are, are uh, looking at this crisis, saying that this is a crisis of globalization, that this is one more uh, element and sort of backlash against open borders, against trade and, and, uh, and, and, and communication, free flow of people. But uh, what, what strikes me is that, on the other hand, it also provides an incredible opportunity to compare what different countries are doing, what they're, uh, how they're dealing with it, to share information and good practices. I mean, once again, all three of you have mentioned how Italy uh, is is only a week or 10 days ahead of, of what France and Germany and probably the United States are going to go through in a harbinger of, of things to come in, in, in that respect. And so, and same thing for the, for the European Union, and Giovanna and, and, and the two of you um, mentioned this on how this could also be an opportunity for Europeans to cooperate, to uh, uh, put in more solidarity, to put in, uh, uh, to put together uh, technical cooperation on, on, on the health and, 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 and mask and equipment, uh, material, uh, this could provide paradoxically an opportunity for Europeans to, to stick together. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sebastian that I'd love to hear any of you uh, uh, address, um, which I think is really important. Do any of the panelists know about any fiscal or economic measures that are going to be deployed in order to avert the negative economic impact of the virus spread? We talked about economic aid to uh, address the um, the virus itself uh, and and uh, fight against its spread, but uh, we can see already some discussions going on about uh, how to address the uh, the risk of recession, the risk uh, of of um, uh, impact on on, on GDP. Uh, and and as you answer this, I think it will be interesting and useful for our um, our auditors to uh, to hear a little bit about the context in which this operates. I mean, uh, Italy was already, uh, especially Italy, was already in a, in a, a complicated economic uh, situation, a complicated political situation, uh, with um, uh, Salvini's Lega being uh, uh, pulling at a very uh, high level. So I think this is also context that's important to understand the, the kind of political and economic impact this could have on, on the European Union. Maybe, Giovanna, you want, you want to start by addressing this? Yeah. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Sebastian for his question. Um, yes, so the way it operates. So the Italian government has been allocating um, 25 billion euros to support the economy in these very um, hard uh, times. Uh, some of this uh, is not going to be spent uh, immediately, but it's going to be um, a, a played day by day. A day and of course the first chunk will go to support the healthcare system the way it operates so um, as you may know is Italy is obliged to respect the fiscal compact that basically imposes um, a three percent um, ratio between deficit spending and uh, am I everything is okay as far as hearing yeah okay um, uh, so a three percent maximum ratio between um, uh, deficit spending and uh, GDP um, so uh, basically the EU Commission has been in granting Italy this possibility, so the, the flexibility uh, in terms of deficit spending, and is it, it will be doing the same with other countries, as far as I as I hear. Uh, so definitely, this is a big fiscal stimulus uh, for the economy, and the problem is like at this point is not even related to the money itself because yes um, with allocating more resources it's good to have as a, um, as a safety net for the economy to help people with sitters in order for them to go to be able to go to work at the same time though what we need to buy I, at this point, at this moment, is time. So that's why all these unpopular measures of closure are actually being implemented in order to prevent contagion, because the um, the contagion rate needs to be slowed down, uh, slowed down, and therefore, in order to liberate and give time time to emergency care units to be um, you know, to face this crisis. And I think the European Commission has released today um, that would be uh, the, you know, announced like 25 billion um, quickly to, to support research and uh, econo economy. Uh, and it will be actually the challenge, the challenge that will happen after the virus is gone. So we'll see actually the Europe, how the European Union will react, how will the fiscal stimulus will continue, and I guess it will be so. And if we can even push forward the discussion of 
uh, sharing risks and prosperity with euro-backed bonds. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Giovanna. Uh, Rachel, let me turn to you because uh, this also strikes at the heart a moment where President Macron is trying to push structural reforms to the French economy. We've seen unemployment numbers uh, go down, but as, as Giovanna just says, this also goes at, at, at the heart of some of the debates that have been agitating the European Union over fiscal redistribution, over uh, integration of the Eurozone, austerity measures. We've, we're seeing this debate also go on right now in, in Germany and maybe affect the, the transition post Merkel. How do you think the economic impact, and obviously they're still very complicated to assess at this stage, but the, the long-term economic impacts of the crisis that we're going through might affect these uh, debates in the European Union? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in some ways, it's hard to say. I, I have these flashbacks to the euro crisis of 10 years ago, where it was, you know, Italy contagion. And so, you know, now it's a different kind of contagion, but it's the same kind of question, right? I mean, if the Italian economy collapses, it's the third largest in the eurozone, the first, fourth largest in in Europe, then that's a huge issue. And once again, we're at a similar question for France. Is France part of Northern Italy or Southern Italy? And it's kind of both. And I think that you mention that the this is obviously, well, it's coming at a time when the, you know, Merkel is having the long, long goodbye, the Franco-German relationship. If the Franco-German relationship is kind of not supportive of Italy, as Natalie pointed out, that is just going to lead that the, then the right wing Lega party is just going to come roaring back. You know, Europe failed us. Our European overlords don't recognize us. China helps us more. And I also, as an aside, Matteo Salvini, the opposition leader, the head of the right wing league party, he is all for closing everything, no shops, no nothing. And so his new approach, which is the approach of businesses of Lombardy, is like close everything so then we can you know start ripartiamo insieme like we'll get back on our feet once we close everything down again i think that um you know this is like the euro crisis but you know in some ways way worse and it and it again reveals the the structural flaws in the single currency and in 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 how europe operates one other point about france france has requisitioned all masks only the government has them. You cannot buy them in stores. It's illegal. I asked a friend, where can I get a mask? And he said, well, I think on the black market. Like, well, I don't think I'm shopping for black market masks. But, um, you know, in any case, just to say that France has also, I, that might have changed now with the announcement yesterday from Europe. But as you said, a week ago, they're keeping medical equipment. They don't want to share it. And Germany, you know, Germany has a lot of medical making companies. So again, if... I think the, the basic issue is who knows how Europe is going to actually come together on this. But if it isn't a cohesive response, it will give a lot of oxygen to parties that think that Europe is, you know, the bad guy and not we're all in this together. Yeah, it will give a lot of oxygen to people thinking that Europe is, is the bad guy. You said the Euro crisis and even even worse. I think that's a, a really striking and interesting uh, comment. And I'd love Natalie to, to weigh in also on, on this debate on uh, the economic impact, the response to it, and may, whether this might shift the conversation, uh, especially in Germany, on on austerity and redistribution within the European Union. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, sort of, we're really talking about short, medium, uh, and, and slightly more long term. I mean, considering that what well, the timeframes, obviously, I have in mind is a few days, a few months, and and, and a few years, um, not not longer than that. But, but I think in the immediate term, the question, sort of the number one question is really one of coordination. Um, because let us assume, I mean, you know, it's not so only a question of coordination in order to share lessons uh, and in order to ensure that the kind of experience that Italy is having can actually be of some use to others uh, to, prevent, uh, to, to prevent the same evolution of, uh, of the curve. Um, but it's also to avoid a situation whereby at some point, let's say in two weeks time, uh, Lombardy gets over its peak, uh, but in, uh, you know, across the border, so in, in France or in, in Germany, the situation gets rough again. Uh, and indeed, there is a, 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 an instance of recontagion back into Italy. So not only will a coordination, a lack of coordination not have helped, 
other European countries to learn from one another. But a lack of coordination could have recreated a, a new problem. Uh, in, in, and, and this is, I think, it goes to the point that Rachel was making about um, the, the closure narrative, the populist closure narrative that this could really be. So that would be, in my view, if you like, number number one point. The second is indeed the money. I mean, this is a sort of uh, the medium term meaning what happens in the next weeks, basically, uh, and and really ensuring not only that you indeed don't have the negative stories about uh, export uh, <laughs> controls, basically, but also that you do actually have the positive stories about medical equipment, uh, in particularly respirators, uh, actually being uh, sent. Um, if, if the situation continues as, as it is. Now, of course, the snag here and the difficulty is that, you know, why is China in the position now of sending respirators? Well, because it's past its own peak. Mm -hmm. So clearly the situation of other European countries, fearing that they may be in Italy's position in a few days or in a few weeks' time, is indeed a a protectionist one. Uh, but, but, but this is indeed, I think, the, the risk that we're facing, which is why I think it's so important that the 25 billion, in, uh, particularly in, in support of public health system, uh, uh, is, is so important. Uh, and, and ensuring that that money actually comes, comes and it comes quickly and it comes in a, in, a, in a visible and tangible way. And then indeed there is the long-term story. And here, Benjamin, it goes to, to your question, you know, to what extent, much like the Eurozone crisis was, in some respects, an opportunity that was only half seized, because of course we know that the banking union was uh, done, but it was only done uh, halfway and nothing else was done in terms of a fiscal union. Is the coronavirus crisis going uh, to lead to that injection, that momentum, back into revising the rules of the Eurozone? Uh, which, um, you know, were completely stuck over the last five years uh, because there was no crisis. So if we look at the uh, political institutional mandate that uh, uh, ended uh, last, last November, basically absolutely nothing was done on reform of the Eurozone. Now, the first months of this current mandate, big on green, big on digital, um, frankly speaking, not particularly big on Eurozone reform. Now, the point is, can this be an opportunity that is seized, question mark, to move forward, particularly when it comes to, to the fiscal union? Uh, when it comes to Europe, you know, simply looking back at precedent, as uh, my, my, my sort of expectation would be, it will probably be yet again another half-seized, half-missed opportunity. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure what, but I'm pretty sure that something uh, will be done, but that probably that something will be uh, woefully insufficient um, to ensure that Europe is equipped to deal with the next economic crisis that will come uh, sometime for sure down the line. Yeah, uh, half seas, half missed, and you mentioned previously missed opportunities on Eurozone integration in the last few years. And, and really, we see that this crisis is striking at two of the key pillars of the European Union, which is uh, open borders and Schengen and uh, European economic solidarity and, and redistribution. Um, we're getting uh, many questions on, on, on the variety of, of issues. Uh, one is on the question of borders, actually. Where do we stand currently on uh, the question of whether borders are open or not between France and Italy, between various European countries. I think there's a lot of uh, confusion also that uh, it would be useful to sort of clarify over uh, uh, Schengen. I think it's important to uh, mention that Schengen uh, has a clause where it could be uh, open borders can be uh, somewhat suspended for uh, national security reasons. We've seen this during the uh, migration crisis, but I'd love all of you to maybe say a, a, a word to this. And, and what is the, the, the status of the debate about open borders right now in Europe? And we've seen, once again, this debate go on for at least the last five years since the migration crisis of 2015. I think it's also important to remember that we're having this conversation in the context of a new migration crisis coming from uh, Syria, once again, with, with Greece and Bulgaria. The leaders of the European Union were in, in Greece last week. So this is these two crises that are really striking at the heart of uh, the European uh, model. I don't know if maybe, Giovanna, do you want to uh, say a word on, on uh, how this affects the, the question of borders? Um, no. Or then maybe Rachel and, and Natalie? I can tell you that if anything, this 
virus has shown that there are no borders and probably even more the migration crisis. This is the issue that is not only affecting Southern European countries, but every, every country, unfortunately. And many are in denial, as Richard was pointing out, and also the Netherlands have been quite a bad example on, on this too. Um, as far as Schengen, what I know is that Slovakia and, uh, not Slovenia, sorry, and um, Austria have been only halting the circulation of people uh, with Italy, but not uh, trade at the moment. Um, uh, Germany was, com uh, Chancellor Merkel was completely against uh, the closing, like the suspending Schengen, uh, but there was the leader of, of national rally in France, uh, Marine Le Pen, who has advocated for um, suspending Schengen, and same thing as Matteo Salvini. Um, and I think um, Spain has suspended direct flights uh, to Italy as well. Um, so it's the there's a big debate of like whether it's effective, what it's not. Um, to be honest, uh, at this stage, it's really unthinkable as probably, and as um, uh, Rachel mentioned, uh, yes, Italians were emotional probably afterwards, but at the beginning it was very, very, um, very much an attitude of like letting things go and thinking that this was a regular flu until reports from the field were in. And definitely Italy has not uh, the capacity of China of building up a hospital in, um, in 10 days. Uh, and so all these measures that seem to be absurd in the beginning now have you know some some ratio and so i would not um, rule out the chance that european countries might suspend um, schengen in light of this emergency um, to what extent is going to help I'm not sure, but it is an unprecedented um, contagion and unprecedented crisis, probably as disruptive as 9-11 or the 2008 economic crisis, even more so, because it's not just health crisis, but also economic crisis that is going to come for the next years. Um, uh, but um, I guess uh, the, the impossibility of also getting real numbers around this, because Italy, yes, is testing more people than other countries, yet running out of, um, of ma uh, machinery, also swabs for, uh, for the testing. But the fact that many people might have been contracted the virus and not showing symptoms or also having uh, very mild symptoms prevent then statistics from be accurate about the mortality rate. So it's so unprecedented, so unknown that only a team, um, a very uh, big coordination between uh, scientific teams in different countries can actually have a good response or at least attempt to have one since it's unprecedented. Yeah, it, it, it's very useful to mention this. There's been a lot of confusion and debate about the statistics, obviously, the level of infection, and, and all three of you have mentioned the disparities in, in testing and even the opacity over the numbers of people tested in, in various countries, uh, which affects completely how we think about the mortality rate. We're having uh, here in the United States a mortality rate that's above 3%, but obviously, there's a debate about whether uh, all the people who might have contracted the coronavirus, especially people who are less at risk of, of, of dying from it, have been, have been tested and accounting for. And we see uh, data in, in countries like South Korea that have more widespread testing and have been more transparent about it, where the mortality rate seems to hover more around uh, 1%. So we're still operating, obviously, on, on a lot of uh, confusion and asymmetry of, of information. Um, Rachel, I want to ask you to react to, to what you've heard and maybe also say a word of the debate about borders that you see in, in the European Union. You think it's one more uh, 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 elements of, of backlash against uh, the Schengen system in the European Union. Whether the whether this virus crisis is is kind of causing that? Well, I mean, look, the virus knows no borders and it just travels around. And I think that the people who want borders to be closed, you know, they feel like this gives them rationale to to keep that argument. I mean, Schengen is occasionally suspended. I mean, it's sometimes suspended if you know there's a terrorist threat or in election seasons. Uh, occasionally, it's suspended. Um, and I mean, I think it'll just embolden whatever side has that argument. But I mean, as 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 Giovanna um, and Natalie were also saying, I think I mean this really it, it's an opportunity for cooperation. But again, I mean, I think that this is not about the border. It's about just flights 
are not going from France to Milan anymore. I mean, it's not about a land border. It's about like who's coming and going. And so I think that the whole idea of the border is a little bit um, fluid. And I think that, um, you know, I think it will embolden political actors who think that borders should be enforced. But I also think counter to that, you know, there has to be a broader European response, which symbolically at least speaks to the idea of, you know, working across borders. So short answer is I'm not quite sure whether Schengen will be suspended and if that's really the issue right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and once again, I mean, have you said uh, Schengen has been suspended already in, in the past and it is including within the, the Schengen system that is actually much more flexible than, than people give it credit for. Uh, most of the time to deal with these sort of short-term uh, crisis. The, obviously, I think a question is the longer-term support for the system of, of open borders and for the system of, of, of free flow. But as we've seen, we see in the United States, obviously, uh, and, and elsewhere, that this virus knows uh, uh, no borders. I want to uh, turn to Natalie, and I think we're nearing the end of, of this conversation, but to see if you want to add anything on on what's been said on, on the necessity for cooperation with Europeans, obviously on the question of, of, of borders. And uh, we still have some, I think, more precise question. I don't know if you have any information on this, on uh, how more specifically the 25 billion coming from the European Union uh, um, will be um, uh, distributed in, in Italy, what kind of, of companies, what kind of priorities this, uh, this money is supposed to uh, account for. Okay, so I mean, on this question, I don't have more information than what had, uh, what has been uh, publicly released uh, yesterday by by the Commission. I mean, all I can say beyond, I mean, within, as you were, I think you were saying, within the twenty five, or Joanna was saying, within the twenty five billion, there is the seven point uh, five billion that are, are currently already. Uh, in, in, you know, have already been given uh, to the country because they are part of cohesion funds. And the point is redirecting those cohesion funds uh, to public health uh, service. Um, so uh, that, that's one part of the story. The other big part of the story, but that this goes more into the sort of uh, economic short term or medium term economic measures, um, it's basically um, sort of uh, temporarily revising the state aid rules so as to defer the payments, the loan payments of small to medium sized enterprises that otherwise risk uh, being uh, shut down basically in, in the next few months. But I cannot give you more, more precise details than, than that. Um, the other sort of two quick reflections back to this to this border question uh, is are really the following. I mean, yes, indeed, the virus uh, sees no borders. Uh, yes, but at the same time, the solution in order to slow down the contagion has been precisely the close down of borders. Now, not just the close down of national borders, though, but the close down of borders within. Uh, countries as well as we've been seeing in in the case of Italy. So in my mind, uh, thinking about the sort of more more long-term implications about the sustainability of Schengen, this has less to do with whether borders, whether whether within or between countries are temporarily closed, because they can be closed for very good reasons, but whether that closure is coordinated, uh, whether it is a sort of coordinated top-down process rather than a sort of haphazard Uh, a process whereby out of sheer panic, uh, member state X does one thing, member state Y does another, and indeed because the coronavirus sees no borders, not only does it have a negative political impact, but it does not have a positive public health impact either. Yeah, it's not just about the border, it's about if you arrive in a country with a fever, you know, it's not about the border, it's about, you know, testing at airports and, and, and things like that too. But it is also quite fascinating that, you know, I would not have found it believable a few weeks ago that an entire country is like, yes, we don't mind, we'll stay home and we'll close the borders and we actually want more restrictions. I mean, I still find that, you know, it's just been a huge mental shift in, in, in the last week. Yeah, uh, I think, a huge mental shift. This is a good way to close this conversation. Uh, we are not there yet in the United States, but we're obviously following very closely what's happening in Europe. We're sending also our, our uh, thoughts of solidarity with our friends in, in France and Italy and, and trying to uh, 
be responsible and stay safe here in the United States. And this is why uh, we wanted to have this, this conversation here uh, on online. I, I want really to thank all three of you for your uh, in insightful remarks. Please um, um, follow our, uh, our, our guest. Uh, we, you've uh, written and commented on, on Twitter, uh, in the Atlantic, on the Brookings website, uh, on, on this crisis, in the impact it would have on European geopolitics, on liberal democracies, on, on the European Union. I think we've really seen the, the heart of the debate uh, here today, which is whether this will only fuel the, the closure populist narrative on the one hand in the European Union, being one more blow to uh, the European project or on the country if European leaders and societies are able to seize this opportunity, seize this as a, and make the case for more solidarity, more unity, more uh, uh, cooperation. I think we'll, we'll see the proof of this in, in the next few days, which will be really a critical first to support Italy, but then obviously the rest of European countries that will be affected by uh, COVID-19 and here at the European Union at the Future Europe Initiative, we'll be following this very closely because we, we care about the importance of the EU and the transatlantic uh, bond. And on this, as on many issues, the fact that we're affected by the same crisis shows once again the necessity for transatlantic cooperation that's at the heart of what we do here at the, at the Atlantic Council. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank those who joined the conversation and commented and asked questions. You can continue the conversation with us on uh, Twitter by engaging with the AC Future uh, Europe uh, Twitter account. And I'm sure, unfortunately, that we'll have, we'll need to have uh, more conversation on, on this topic in the next few uh, days and week. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.